All right, here's a few news articles that are interesting. Um, here, we're going to do this next semester in the uh, Hacking Android Devices class, and iPhones will be proxying traffic so you can watch it, which is a big deal for web app hacking, too. I have two classes using this technique a lot. And uh, there's a whole lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, you redirect all your traffic going to the internet to go through a proxy so you can examine it and modify it. And Android has a lot of tricks that can sometimes make that difficult. And one of them is uh, some apps use pinning. So that's where it tries real hard to make sure that the SSL certificate that it is seeing is the correct certificate and you have to fool it. And we'll talk more about this later in, as you discuss TLS, there are various ways to trick a phone or a web app into believing you're using a good certificate when you aren't. Um, but they don't make it easy, of course. I've heard, heard more at a meeting today about uh, Salesforce certificates and Salesforce training. There's this free Salesforce training. I don't have it yet. We've been talking about how maybe we should teach it. Maybe students should get it. You can get jobs with it. I must say, I have only the dimmest idea of what Salesforce even is. Some kind of customer relationship management system, I think. But uh, anyway, um, maybe I'll get the first certificate and then I'll have more of a clue what it's, what it's there for. They, they hire a lot of students. It's definitely a valuable skill. And I would assume after learning the rudiments of what it is, there are probably some security issues to know too, but I don't know any of it. Uh, this one I'll get back to later. I'm just going to download it now. All right. And this is kind of fun. Um, I had made a CTF in COBOL and I trotted at a few conventions and might again. Um, COBOL is interesting. It's also as old as I am from 1959. But anyway, there's a lot of people talking about why people still use COBOL. And the point is, it's like those old Cisco routers. You can set up stuff running on a mainframe in COBOL and it will just keep working for 30 or 40 years. And that's really not true of the modern stuff. So although it is extremely unglamorous and old fashioned, there's a lot of stuff really done on COBOL. Almost all financial transactions involve going through COBOL. This was pretty interesting to me. I think what I'm watching is just unbelievable. It makes me feel like we should just cancel all these classes. How powerful social engineering is. I mean, Trump appears to be making progress in reversing the election and ending American democracy even right now. And if he get back, gets back in in 2024, which I expect he will, I think he'll succeed in 2028 with just another four years to get ready. And it's all through an amazing process. And apparently this has been known for about a century, social engineering. Um, and it's a military disinformation technique. You can feed people lies and you can get them used to believing something false and you can get them mad at people for no good reason and move them into a crazy place. And he's done it. And, uh, Anyway, this guy talks. This guy used to be a conservative journalist, and he talked about how the um, the conservatives don't believe that the purpose of news is to find the truth. They have this huge um, attitude that they are being abused by people on the left being unfair to them. So the purpose of journalism is to balance that by pushing the conservative thing extremely and trying to, to balance the scale. And that's, uh, that's Trump's whole thing. He's aggrieved, everyone's mean to him, so he's allowed to do rotten things. And it is amazing how far he's getting. Um, the Rudy Giuliani is a joke and it's all failing in court, but the latest trick of just getting Republican um, electors to not certify the vote seems to be making real progress. So I don't, people say he probably won't make it this time, but I expect him to make it in 2028 unless something changes. Of course, something else may change by then. But this technique is extremely effective, and I just don't know how we can possibly uh, prevent it in a democracy. Anyway, um, everyone's mad at these Apple. Some few people got these new Apple Macs, and they're happy, and they say they run fast, but they can't run old code in them very well. And now they're finding that if you try to restore them, it bricks it. It won't even boot up. So there's clearly some serious flaws in them. And uh, I'm not getting one for a while. So here's one that caught a lot of attention. Um, Krebs, uh, Charles, Chris Krebs is quite a cool guy. He went to the DEF CON conference last year and went to the voting. The last year it was in physical, it was about 18 months ago. He went to the voting booth, um, voting machine hacking village, and he gave a talk about the security of elections. He was a very cool guy. And he, but the reason Trump just fired him is he put up a page saying there is no voting fraud. 
saying I'm debunking common myths about voting fraud, which is basically everything Trump has been saying. There's nobody messing with the election machines. There's nobody sneaking in ballots from dead people or any of that stuff. And so Trump fired him. Um, so he, uh, he can continue to push these uh, lies without being as directly contradicted by his own officials. So um, he expected it. It's not quite clear what it means. The immediate thing it means, I think, is he's free to join the Biden team right now without having to wait. If Biden wants him, which I think he would. But anyway, um, it is, uh, Trump is doing an awful lot of things at the end of his term to make it look like he's not leaving, like uh, big major new international moves, sending uh, you know, a lot of things he shouldn't be doing if he was really leaving. Anyway, in case you people want to plan your educational future, someone gave us this handy list of 366 security certifications. So God have mercy on you. Here's CISSP. We cover that one. <laughs> Here's CEH. Somewhere down here, we more or less cover that one. You know, we cover like four of these. Like, and it, it is just kind of mind boggling. And I, I remember Richard uh, Wu gave a talk one time and he had a, he gave a slide like this of all the products you might want to buy and install in your company, and there were 100 of them. It just makes you want to give up and cry. I and mean, that's why a lot of people get upset, like that um, attack matrix with the 230 attack techniques. This field is extremely overcomplicated, you know? It is not reasonable to expect anybody to understand this much junk and make intelligent decisions about it all. We need, uh, we need like an Einstein to organize and think of a better way to look at this. <laughs> this can't be the road forward. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's where we are. Of course, now, in the meantime, uh, the way to handle a thing like this, of course, is you don't even look at a list of 360. You get somebody to give you like the top five or the top 10, <laughs> and then you get those. But anyway, there really are all these certificates out there. <laughs> I don't know what you're supposed to do with that information, but it's true. All right, and uh, this one, I think I'll just talk about now. I thought this was interesting and I might turn it into a project and then I read this paper and decided I don't really have to. This just came out from an Amazon researcher and some others. They found this new cryptographic property called key commitment, which um, is remember authenticated encryption. We already covered you encrypt something and you have a tag to prove that it really is the person who encrypted it had the secret and is really the person you think should have it, or at least it has a hash of the document there. And apparently you can make documents that can be decrypted with two keys and into two different valid files, which I wouldn't have thought is possible, but you can by finding file formats that let you put extra junk at the beginning or the end and filling it with things like zeros. Um, it is possible to do that. And there are certain situations under which that basically is like the, um, the attack we talked about before where you can forge something that appears to make it look like you have the key when you don't have the key. You can forge something that can be decrypted. Anyway, so uh, to fix that, you have to add some extra um, padding, essentially, uh, or something like something about the key inside the document so that um, it can verify that the key is correct. And we'll talk about a similar issue tonight. Anyway, it's a cute idea, key commitment, and uh, how to add key commitment to authenticated encryption, which is not in the current techniques in use although Amazon just patched it on their servers. So I don't know, there, anyway, it's an interesting uh, obscure issue and I, uh, I decided not to get hands-on project with it because we got enough other similar hands-on projects that we're gonna talk about. Anyway, I highly encourage you to come at one on Saturday to meet um, this guy, David Gerard, who wrote these books and talk about blockchain. And I have some projects I've added to the class um, with more blockchain in it, in case you want to learn more about blockchain and play with it. I turned on my, my blockchain, you can join again. It was down for a couple of years. I put it back up yesterday. So we're here in 141 and we're up to TLS. So let me bring up the slides, which I guess I've got to go get. There we are, TLS. Okay. And so after this, I've got a bunch of new projects to talk about. Um, last time I played this video about why RSA is out of date and you should be using sodium instead. So I wrote sodium projects. So you can use sodium, which is using the more modern encryption protocols. 
And um, we're a couple of blockchains. I added these two at the bottom, multi-chain and joining the SAM chain. I'll talk about them. And like I say, when I made this this morning, I thought I might make a project using this key commitment uh, stuff. He does. He did give you a tool to demonstrate this, but I don't think it's that interesting. I think just the general idea is interesting enough. It's like an existential forgery attack. And uh, I don't think it's worth making a hands-on project out of it right now. So we're going to talk about what TLS is for, um, what the goals of TLS were, and the various older versions leading up to it, like SSL and the earlier versions of TLS, and why they, we went up to TLS 1.3, which is the newest version and much better. Um, TLS is at the heart of almost everything you do to be secure on the internet. And of course, it turned out to have a lot of defects and been through many generations. So the point of this is to create a secure communication channel so you can have encryption. This was invented by Netscape. In the early days, the internet didn't have any encrypted communication at all. And Netscape was the, the first web browser, or the first people to think about handling passwords and credit card numbers and stuff on the web. And they invented a encryption protocol. They also invented cookie storage, calling it the magic cookie. They, they invented authentication and encryption to be used on the internet. And uh, so they invented the first version of SSL and the magic cookie, and everything has grown from that early beginning. Uh, TLS grew until it supported way too many protocols and way too many old vulnerable protocols, and there were a bunch of attacks. Heartbleed that could leak out the key and Beast and Crime and Poodle that involved sending millions and millions of requests and deducing something about the key from the uh, imperfections in the encryption systems used many, many attacks on these. Many of these are very impractical and not likely to really compromise anything, but Heartbleed in 2014 was easy to do and practical and likely to leak out the secret key. That really scared people. And it convinced people to really move forward. The other thing, of course, was Edward Snowden. When Snowden dumped out all the information about what the um, NSA had been doing to spy on American companies, everybody freaked out and they moved up to TLS 1.2 to get forward secrecy, which we'll talk about. So it greatly uh, caused a big jump forward in encryption security as people moved up to protocols that could no longer be spied on so easily, even by the NSA. And so TLS 1.3 was the big leap forward to remove a lot of the old legacy insecure protocols and have a smaller set of choices that are much more secure. So here's the idea. Um, what you want is you want to have a secure channel. You would like to send data to a server and you would like it to be confidential. So encrypted with some key that nobody else has except the people at the ends. Authenticated, so you know who you're talking to. So if you're logging into Google, you know that's really Google and it's not somebody else pretending to be Google. And of course you want integrity. So you're trying to prevent man in the middle attacks, which is an intrinsic problem of the internet. You go to some site, you think it's Yahoo or Google, you have no way to really be sure that's Yahoo or Google. And that's, so the, need, the only way to prevent a man in the middle attack where somebody intercepts your transmissions and pretends to be the other person is you have to have some kind of trusted other channel. For example, you might have had some way to exchange a secret key previously. Then you even possession of that key would mean they knew it, uh, but that's, uh, but the way it's done on the internet is with certificate authorities you talked about. So these are the companies that you trust. They issue certificates. Google presents a certificate. You send it to the certificate authority and say, is this really Google? And they say, yes, that certificate is the card I sold Google. That proves that they're really Google. So as long as you trust the third parties, then you have some high degree of belief that you know who you're talking to. And this is the same principle as driver license and other ID cards. The government issues it and it has some kind of stamp that makes you think it's the genuine thing that came from the government, and therefore that's your trusted third party. So here's the requirements. You want it to be an efficient protocol so it doesn't slow everything down by using up too much CPU. You want it to work all across the hardware on OS. You want it to be extensible and versatile so it can handle the widely changing, constantly changing traffic on the internet. So here's the suite. Um, this is the OSI model layer. Uh, you should know if you've taken network courses, the bottom four layers are very real and really affect the structure of packets. The top three layers are all pretty much just combined in your browser these days. And the point is, uh, down here, you've got different kinds of data you might be sending. So TLS is above layer four. So it encapsulates all the traffic that would be sent out your network. 
That's the plan. And you can encapsulate TCP traffic, which is the most common situation. You can also use TLS on UDP traffic if you want to, and that would be called DTLS, but it's not very common and we're not going to worry about it much. It's the same kind of principle, but normally you want TLS so you can reconstruct things entirely and notice if pieces are missing from it. So like I say, it started in 95 from Netscape with SSL. That was secure sockets layer. But SSL2 and SSL3 were found to have serious security flaws, and they've both been deprecated. Yet no version of SSL is safe enough to use anymore. Uh, it was all replaced by TLS. And all the TLSs are better than the SSL, but of course each one is better. 1.0 is the least secure, then 1.1 is better, and then 1.2 is better, and 1.3 is better than that, of course. And so here's 1.2. Uh, this was from 2008, supported, uh, but it, unfortunately, it had a lot of features and design choices that were brought in from the past. TLS encapsulation encapsulates the other headers. Um, no, it does not. You need those other headers in order to deliver the packet. Um, so it is carried inside the packet. The packet has an Ethernet address and an IP address and a port number, and then inside there is TLS. So I should... So it lives above, lesser, above um, layer four, and therefore it only protects the data up here. The data down here is on the outside of the envelope. So I'm glad you brought that up so I can make that, so I may, I will make sure I make that clear. No protocol can encrypt this data. The only thing that can do that is a VPN. I mean, you can't deliver a packet if you don't have the address information. So, um, the only thing you can protect is the data up here. But this is where all the stuff that you care about usually is your passwords and credit card numbers and such. It might be, if you want to protect this stuff, that means you're trying to prevent someone from seeing where you're going entirely. And the only things that can do that are VPNs and systems like Tor. Good. I'm glad you brought that up. All right. So um, that's 1.2. Okay. And so here's the plan. You have a data encapsulation protocol and you have a handshake protocol. Can you explain why not unencrypted data, not encrypted data on application layer? Well, the original protocol has no encryption, have no encryption at all at any layer, but with TLS, everything from five up is encrypted. The important thing is layer seven. That's what you're trying to encrypt. That's where the uh, web traffic and cookies and passwords and credit card layers are. All the rest of this stuff is pretty much just um, outside of the envelope kind of information. Uh, so the main point of TLS is to provide a secure session here instead of just a normal session, which merely sorts the packets so they reach the right destination, but it doesn't encrypt them. It was creating a secure session here so that it was encrypted and, and uh, had these desirable security features that nobody else could read it and that you knew who you were talking to. That's the point. It replaces the normal session with a secure session. All right, and so the two issues are... Um, encapsulating the data and the handshake. So the normal handshake for TCP is just you send a SYN, it sends a SYN ACK, and you send an ACK, and now those are the three um, packets create a secure channel. Uh, everything is always encapsulated here. Um, the way all network protocols work is you have a uh, packet, and each layer encapsulates the stuff from the layer below it, although it gets a little fuzzy up here. So the physical layer is, is like bits on a wire. Then you have the data link layer with a MAC address, an IP address, and a TCP port number. And each of those is encapsulated. So this eth uh, Ethernet frame here contains data. And inside that data is all these other things. It's like a series of envelopes and boxes inside each other. Anyway, so after you do the TCP handshake, you now have a data channel where you can send data to the server and the data server can send data back to you and it will be correctly sorted and delivered, but nothing's encrypted yet. So after that, you now have more handshake. You send a client hello and then the server sends you a server hello with a certificate. The certificate verifies that the server is who they, they claim to be and now not shown in this diagram, you send that certificate to your trusted third party and they reply before you go any further. So your browser decides this really is the person I wanted to be talking to. And then the client sends up cipher list. It says, here I am, this browser on this operating system, I can speak these 10 ciphers. Are any of them acceptable? The server now chooses one of the ciphers that the client offered and sends 
um, back a agreement, let's use this one, and now we can do um, a handshake and trade a key with Jiffy Hellman typically and end up doing encryption from there. So it's really quite a long process to make a secure connection. I mean, it doesn't take more than a fraction of a second typically, but it's complex. It involves a lot of packets going back and forth. So the client hello is the client listing what ciphers it has, because that's usually the issue. The server is often powerful and modern and kept up to date, but the client could be a cell phone or old browser or something. And uh, so the server has to offer a variety of ciphers. So here's a typical client hello I caught from one of my machines. So it's using the modern version TLS 1.3. I connect to some server and it offers these 18 suites for my client, which is uh, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman uh, with AES 128 Galois counter mode. Somebody told me it's how to pronounce Galois and I already forgot Gala or something. Anyway, um, all these different ones. Here's Cha Cha 120 and Poly 1305, all these different things. This is what my client would talk. Um, why three versions of TLS? Well, they keep writing more versions. You mean in this? Uh, what are the three versions? Well, you mean 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 and 1.3? Oh, well, you know, I am confused. Yeah, there's a 1.0 here and a 1.3 there and a 1.2 there. Now that you mention it, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I, uh, I do not know why. I would expect it to be uniform throughout, but this uh, looks, it's either backward compatibility or it's a defect in the uh, Wireshark um, analysis engine. That's a good question. I am in fact confused. This claims to be a 1.3 with 1.0 inside it. Yeah, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. And 1.2 down here, that is pretty baffling, isn't it? Anyway, so it offers the server all these encryption techniques and the server agrees on one and sends it down. Okay, we're gonna use this one, cha-cha poly, which I think is the most modern and most secure of the available choices. And now that you've agreed on that, now we can continue to talk using that system. So in TLS 1.3, um, it generates a random number here, C, and the server generates a random number and then it computes a secret from it and uh, does Diffie-Hellman and so on. You verify the certificate, verify the signature. And so the point of it is it uses a different random number to create a different session key for every session. Even though it always uses the same certificate and that certificate has a public key, it creates a different session key every time. That's giving it forward secrecy. And we'll talk more about that later. S equal S, S, Q, mean that the server generated public key. Um, these, this is just a random number, S, and it's doing a Diffie-Hellman exchange here. Um, and I, I'm not sure, I don't remember the details. I'm not, all I know is the general outline of this. Uh, we're not gonna get that deep into it, for, at least not for me, Art. Um, I do know that it uses the same public key with elliptic curve or RSA all the time. That's in the certificate. And the point of 1.2 and 1.3 is that they do use a different random number each time also. The small c and the small s change every time. And that means if somebody manages to compromise your session key in one session, they cannot use it to decrypt data from another session, which was possible in TLS 1.0 and I think 1.1 which is what was used almost everywhere on the internet until Snowden spilled the beans. And everybody rushed to get up to TLS 1.2 to fix that problem. But that's just multiplication, SQ. And I think Q is the number it got from the other side. Or, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Anyway, um, so the certificate authorities have certificates which uh, have a public key hard-coded in it that never changes. You use the same one for years. And that's the trusted third party to verify the server and get you started with a public key you can use to send data to the server. So the certificates are these uh, X509 certificates. It's got a serial number, it's got fingerprints, and it's got a public key in here. And it also has the name of the company uh, and, and the name of the uh, organization that verifies it. So this claim the company is Cloudflare and DigiCert is the company that verifies that. And so when you go to Cloudflare, it goes to the DigiCert intermediate server to verify this certificate is accurate. And it goes to the top here 
she verified that that intermediate server is accurate and the address uh, the um, the signature of this certificate is in your browser built in by the browser manufacturer so you know that this is really genuine that's the that's the way it works so in order to get a code signing certificate that will be accepted here you have to buy it from a public company that sells it and I'm in the battle you may have seen my tweets I'm trying to buy one I went with a low-cost provider and they're complete idiots and they keep on ignoring me and not giving me my certificate uh, for three months I've been trying to get a code signing certificate so I can make Windows code that will pass the test and I'm nearly there but uh, because I went for the low cost provider that seems to be complete idiots and having great trouble getting it. And you can't make your own. You have to buy it from one of the trusted certificate authorities. So the TLS record has um, a couple of bytes at the header showing you what version things are. And I'm just looking, this is content type, protocol version, and then length of the data. I'm just wondering if this might answer your other question, but I don't see a situation in which one of these would be 1.2 and the other would be 1.0. Anyway, and then it just has the payload after that. And in TLS 1.3, there are like 16 or 18 versions. And around version 16 of TLS 1.3, they required this zero padding. So everything would be the same length. So you cannot deduce things from length because there was an attack on 1.2, I think. 1.2 had the ability to compress the packets, like zipping it, to make it smaller and faster. But of course, that means that the, the size of the packet gives you a clue about what kind of data is in there. So they took that away. They took away the, 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 the compression, and they padded it so every packet is the same length uh, to prevent that attack. That long time. Oh. Should be back now. Let me take a look. Yeah, okay, good. All right. So, all right, so you got authenticated encryption, a key derivation function, which we talked about before, and um, to take the shared secret from Diffie-Hellman and turn it into a key, and then you use Diffie-Hellman, of course, to exchange keys. And TLS 1.3 has only three algorithms. AES GCM, something called a CCM that is similar, and Cha Cha 20. Um, it does not have RC4 and other old unsafe ones. There's two secret key sizes, 128 or 256 bits. The older versions had these short ones that are not secure. And uh, the key derivation function is here using SHA-256 or SHA-384 um, to create a key from a Diffie-Hellman exchange secret, and you use two options, elliptic curve or the um, integers, modulo prime number, which has five different elliptic curves you can use. We talked about these last time, and these are all pretty fine. Uh, you can also do the old-fashioned prime number modulus stuff, the original Diffie-Hellman exchange, and it allows your key length to go from 2048 to 8192 bits, and that is possibly a weakness of TLS 1.3, because as we know, 2048 is not really recommended anymore. Uh, the security of it is considered less than 100 bits, so probably they shouldn't allow you to use 2048, but they did, and if you do you make that choice, that is the weakest choice available. Although, nobody can break it yet, as far as we know, it's, it's not as secure as all these other choices. Anyway, so here's the improvements. They removed all these weak algorithms. There have been earlier versions like MD5 and RC4 and the CVC that we were doing the uh, padding oracle attack on. Just a whole lot of these old systems have been removed. That's a big step forward. And it removed the data compression that I talked about where the size of the packet would change depending on the contents and that would enable you to do something about the contents. And uh, it now has downgrade protection and these other tricks we'll talk about. The downgrade attack is a big one. You, if the person is here trying to talk to the server, they send a signal to the server that says what version of TLS they want, a person in the middle could lower it and say, no, they want TLS 1.1 instead and get them to use the older, more vulnerable version. That's a downgrade attack. This happens a lot for almost every protocol um, a man in the middle can frequently lower you to a less secure version of protocols if you support legacy protocols. So in order to resist this attack, TLS 
put something in the server hello, it has an eight byte encrypted uh, code, which the client can decrypt, which says what version you're getting. So if they ask for 1.3 and the server gives them 1.1, they will be able to check and find out that's what happened, that they're actually getting the old version. Um, it's like a cookie, but it's, it's at a lower level, I think. And the, um, and the point is that's encrypted in a way that the man in the middle would not be able to uh, modify it. That's the idea. That is the protection against that. And uh, then you have a, um, in this one here, you have to keep waiting for responses. TLS uh, can do it in one round trip to make the handshake a little faster. So that's just a performance issue, not really a security issue. And the other one, I've heard of quite a few people talking about this session resumption. You can resume a session and keep using the same pre-shared key from before. So I guess that might be fine. I know there have been some protocols where these session resumption techniques can be used to break into something. But in here, I think it's okay if the original Diffie-Hellman exchange was secure enough to use once, it could be secure enough to just use again. I think you use it with different random numbers, S, and that other number. So you don't really have the same private key. You just use the same Diffie-Hellman. So it, it lowers the number of exchanges. Anyway, uh, those are a few features it's got. And so uh, this is the resumption handshake. So in, you don't have to do so much work. Um, we have a shorter exchange leading to uh, a authenticated session. So anyway, um, this is why it's strong. You've got a certificate and a certificate authority. Uh, it, encrypts, it typically only authenticates the server. You can, in principle, put a certificate on a client too, but that's expensive and irritating and almost nobody does. So if you're trying to log into Gmail, this does mean you do a TCP handshake with the server before you even know if you're talking to the right person. Then you exchange a certificate and, and all this stuff. Then you know you're talking to the right server. And yet you've never logged in yet. Nobody's verified that you're actually a Google user yet. Not until this is all over and you've done all the cryptography, then you can send a username and password up to log into your account. So that's how it works. And this is why um, Microsoft has a system on their domain controllers called a network access control that verifies that you are the right machine before you make any connection. And here you have quite a lot of traffic exchanged before they verify who you are. So that is something to be aware of. Now that's usually what you want on the internet because a client could be using some new phone they bought or anything, but it is a thing to be aware of that you don't authenticate the client at all until all this has happened. And if you don't like that, then you might want to go down to a system where you actually use a client certificate. The problem then of course, is you have to install that certificate on every client. You have to keep it updated on the server. It's really a whole lot of bother, but it's a lot safer. All right, then, then I mentioned forward secrecy. If, you, if someone manages to steal the client's RAM and they find the session key for their current session, then they can, of course, decrypt all the traffic being sent in the current session. But if you close the browser and open it again, make a new session, it has a new random number and you can't use that key again. Now, if you leave old session keys in RAM from previous browser pages that have been closed, then it can compromise all those sessions too. So that is not so much a weakness in the protocol as a weakness in your software. And uh, I did this at Hope years ago. That was common in browsers about six years ago, that you could steal um, secrets from RAM. The solution is to use this secure strings class in Microsoft Visual Studio or some other product. There are types of variables that will be erased when you're done using them from RAM, and you should be using them. This is Microsoft's solution for that since 2005. Anyway, so there's things that can go wrong. Um, the CA can get compromised. This happened to a few certificate authorities where they get hacked because they don't protect their servers well enough. Then they compromise the private key. Now they can make fake certificates using the secrets from the certificate authority and they will be accepted. So this typically means uh, that certificate authority is destroyed and put out of business. The browser manufacturers remove it from the trusted store and now it won't be accepted anymore. That did kill off a few of them. Uh, and uh, there's no real defense against that. The, uh, this is, uh, you just have market pressure. The certificate authorities have a financial incentive to protect their servers so this doesn't happen to them because if it does happen, they're pretty much out of business. Uh, law enforcement, this came out um, 
about 10 years ago, the um, products are for sale that man in the middle HTTPS. Now the whole point of HTTPS is that should not be possible, but there are commercial products you can buy for corporations and for law enforcement agencies that do man in the middle HTTPS. And this is pretty disturbing. And the way it works is because the certificate authorities do in fact betray you. This has leaked out. Certificate authorities will sell you a legitimate root certificate so you can impersonate them to anybody that gives them enough money, apparently. Whoever, whoever the, this has been going on, it's one of those open secrets like uh, China hacking everybody. There were things that people in the security industry do that nobody would actually say out loud for a long time. And this leaked out around 2010 and 2012 that uh, certificate authorities, pretty much all of them, had been secretly selling root certificates to people they thought they could trust to, to be quiet about it. And that's what goes on with these law enforcement devices and with the corporate devices that man in the middle age GDPS. So uh, when you verify the certificate, you say, there, that proves I'm talking to Google. That is not really true. You're talking to Google or you're talking to somebody who bribed your certificate authority and you're agreeing to let them be impersonated, which was happening and probably is still happening. It kind of has to be for this reason. So go, go in flight. Many people have found these flaws. If you go to go, go in flight, they're bad in the middle of the certificate. Um, if you go to, uh, even in 2008, um, one of the certificate authorities, and one of the big ones was still using MD5 as the hashing algorithm for their certificates. So uh, at by that time, computers are fast enough that you could forge the signature. You can make another certificate that would pass that test because they're using this ridiculously insecure MD5 hashing algorithm. Uh, that was one of the things that finally convinced people to stop using MD5. Um, all right, and so if I install, now if I can compromise your client, how do you tell real certificates? Well, that's the problem. Uh, the only way you can tell a real certificate is you ask the certificate authority to verify it. And you have to trust that the certificate authority is not lying to you. If the certificate authorities lie to you, the entire system breaks down. And that's why some people prefer the um, friend of a friend system where you have key signing parties and you trust it because you know the people that said that's really a key. That's the PGP system. But this is the best system we have. And as all these scandals came out, a lot of people got very upset and said, we should have a better system. And uh, um, Moxie Marlin Spike and other people all said, that we should have some kind of other rating of how trustworthy certificates are, but none of that has really happened. They've been talking about it for at least 10 years and no improvement has really appeared. Uh, the certificates are embedded in the browser. What's embedded in the browser is a, um, a number that lets you identify the official certificate authorities. So when you talk to a certificate authority, um, you can verify that they have the secret. So that means you're either really talking to the real certificate authority or you're talking to somebody else who has gotten that secret and been authorized to imitate them. And so that means they're either the real certificate authority or there's someone who bribed them or there's someone who hacked them or they're a government who pressured them into handing over the secrets. Um, yeah, well, any, you can fake certificates with any device. It doesn't take much of anything, Chaz. You can make your browser, make certificate, uh, does the encryption all the time. You can make certificates with any device. The math is not hard. The only thing is you need to know the secret key, which is stored only by the certificate authority, unless they sell it to you, or you steal it, or you force them to hand it over. So um, this gets real deep. I mean, ultimately, all security relies on you trusting somebody, and there is some scenario in which they betray you. And this is how you end up in things like, say, Bitcoin. Um, if you don't trust anybody, if you don't even trust your government, then it gets actually really hard to decide who you can trust. Um, a VPN will not protect you from any of this. All a VPN will do is encrypt your traffic between you and the VPN server. So nobody near you can spy on it. But once you're at the VPN server, you'll then connect to a server like Google, and you're using exactly the same system to verify that it's really Google you're talking to. So if Google was to, or Google's certificate authority was to let somebody else use their private key, they could put up a fake Google and you would believe it. Your browser would believe it. And there's no way you would ever know it was not true. 
That's right. So that's, that's an issue. In practice, it seems to work pretty well, but it's not perfect. And uh, anyway, so if someone can compromise your machine, they could put a rogue certificate authority. You can add special certificate authorities into your browser to say, also trust these people. And if I do that to your machine, then I can use my, my rogue certificate authority and you'll believe it. So that's an issue. Um, then there was Heartbleed. Heartbleed was a bug in the, in the HTTPS protocol where you could send a heartbeat signal to the server and the server would echo it back. So you'd send it a word and it would send the word back to you just to keep the connection alive. But you could send it a short word with a long length and it would then send you extra data back so you could get random RAM images from the server and eventually you'd find the private key in there. So you could get the private key off the server, which is not good. And the Fiddler software, yeah. Um, yes, Fiddler and Burp both do this. Um, all proxies do this essentially. You make a proxy, you connect to it, and the proxy will forge certificates and send you fake certificates. And that's what this go go in flight thing was doing. It'll send you a fake certificate, but the certificate will have this error signed by an untrusted user. Your browser will not be fooled by it. It'll say, this is a bogus certificate and pop up an error message and warn you that something appears to be wrong here. So I mean, that's what's supposed to happen. And if you don't want your, you know, if you wanted to do this at a company, this is what you're supposed to do to man in the middle HTTPS. You put up a proxy, you put up fake certificates, the browsers have these error messages, and then you push onto those machines in group policy or something, an update that will install the root certificate from your certificate authority into the trusted store. So now the company machines will trust your company server and they'll let it do this man in the middle attack. That is how HTTPS is supposed to work. And that's fine, but if people bring in their cell phone from home, it will be popping up these error messages because it won't have the company official certificate. And so if you are like an internet service provider and you want to man in the middle people who have not agreed to this, you need a real root certificate private key. And if you're the law enforcement and you just want to uh, drive a stingray truck into town and man in the middle traffic, uh, you read a real trusted certificate authority key. And apparently, corporations and law enforcement are able to get that. Repeat the MIM intercept. Um, well, let's see. I think I should have a picture back here. Yeah, this this will do. So I have, this person is trying to reach this server. I'm in the middle. And I give them the wrong certificate. I make them a fake certificate with the wrong key. So their data is going to be encrypted with a key that I know. Then I connect to the server here. The browser will warn them that this certificate came from an untrusted source unless I have the private key of a real trusted certificate authority. And the only way I could get that is by bribing them or stealing it from them or pressuring them because I'm a government agency. But that does happen. So if the police drive into your neighborhood and intercept the traffic and try to spy on you, your browser will pop up an error message unless they have a genuine certificate private key here. And these boxes do apparently rely on that. You have this box, which can do the man in the middle attack, but you have a USB port someplace on here. You have to feed in a real private key from a real trusted certificate authority. So it is not explained where you get that, but this box would be useless unless there was a way to get that. So apparently law enforcement agencies are able to get it from at least one of the certificate authorities. Well, man in the middle caused the handshake sequence to be disrupted. Package sequencing? No, I don't think it will. It's uh, not any more than anything else because it all just rides on uh, TCP. So you're allowed to have extra hops and all that. That won't matter. So I don't think you'll, you'll have any much of a clue that it's happening. That's why. Um, now, there is a solution, which is pinning, which we'll get to. Anyway, so um, all right. So, but here's Heartbleed. Heartbleed was one where you could leak the private keys off a server, which is pretty bad. That was why everybody completely freaked out when Heartbleed came out. That's been patched, of course. And so you can go to here and test a certificate. There's SSL Labs online TLS test. That'll just tell you if a certificate is using the latest version of everything. Let's Encrypt is the uh, free certificates for everybody that came out a few years ago, and that's making everyone switch to TLS easier. And here's what you do to stop these man in the middle attacks and other errors. HTTP strict transport security is a 
header you put in an HTTP server telling it to remember um, the certificate for the first time it connects and then always expect that certificate to be the same. So this makes it very difficult to do a man in the middle attack on a popular website. The problem is this turned out to be so hard to maintain in practice that they no longer rec uh, recommend it. Um, or is it, no, this, this is a good one. H, this direct brand for security is recommended. This is the one that's not recommended. Public key pinning is where you build into your app the, pri the public key. So it goes through the certificate, and if the certificate doesn't have exactly the public key you expect it to have, you reject it. The problem is, sooner or later your certificate expires, you want to move to a different server or something, and if you do that, you have to update all the apps. And the old apps can't connect anymore, and that turned out to be very difficult to maintain in practice. So that was deprecated. Um, they tried to roll it out, and after a few years, they found out it was such a mess, they rolled it back. And so they were recommended is this new thing called Expect CT to prevent fraudulent certificates. So this is what has come of all the concerns about this. There's a couple of web header protocols you can put in which have some other checks put on certificates to detect if the certificate looks fishy. That's what came of it. All right. Well, let's do some of these cahoots, and then I've got some extra stuff to show you after I process this video. Uh, we are at 141, Chapter 13. All right. And it's here. Here, okay. I think they've changed the background. Yeah, I'm not sure how expect CT works. Yeah, they're not very helpful, Jimmy. They, they just make trouble. Anyway, all right. Uh, wait a few more seconds. Yeah, it might be nice to make projects where we try using those extra headers and see what they do, but I haven't done that yet. All right, now how do I start it? Oh, here, okay. Just this new background makes it hard to see. Okay. Okay, so what version of SSL is good? Yep, none of them are safe. SSL is completely obsolete. All right, uh, which one lists many ciphers? That's the client hello. Your browser tells the server what encryption it supports. All right, and what mitigates traffic analysis? Yep, that's zero padding, so the size of the packets does not vary. All 
All right, what's the shortest secret key? Twenty-eight. Older versions let you have those shorter ones, but now it's at least one twenty-eight. All right, and which of these is no longer recommended? Public key pinning. All right, good. So, have to tell me who it is. That's a name I know. That's a real name, real initials, I think. All right, good. So, I'm going to stop this video and take 10 minutes to process it. And then I'll come.